Welcome to AEC Stories. This is former SM3 Dempsey of the USS Mount Hood. And today I've got a special guest, Chris Ryden, who was a signalman on the USS Stark. Um, it's a very historical and uh, interesting podcast. So welcome aboard. And how are you doing today, Chris? Not too bad, Lynn. Long day at work? Oh, yeah, of course. I appreciate you hopping on here. I can imagine, like, all day grinding over there at the Pentagon and then hopping on a podcast. That must be uh, a wear out. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. At least I'm home in my recliner. So <laughs> That's the best way to do podcasts, I think, out of recliners. But um, today I'm back to back, and it's like I'm getting the signalman, man. This is... I think the best podcasters are signalmen guys. And, you know, unless any other rates want to compete with us and show us up on here, you're welcome. But, uh, <laughs> whoever's listening is probably like whatever signalman. But, uh, <laughs> I just, um, I just did a podcast. <clears throat> I just get off with the guy probably about 15 minutes ago. And he was a signalman in the early sixties and John Wayne was hanging out with them for days and hours on the signal bridge. Because they were filming in harm's way. Oh, that's cool. Damn cool. Isn't that cool? You know, uh, doing this, I feel like I'm I'm reaching out. I, I feel like I'm sending the flashing light when I do these podcasts with you guys. I'm like, okay, hit them up on Facebook. That's my new flashing light. Let's see if we get an answer. <laughs> yeah. Now we we did it. We did a great podcast, and we talked about your experience on the Stark. And, um, but I, I want to recap on a few things because that podcast just does not sound good enough to do it justice. Like I said, um, so what made you decide to join the Navy? How old were you when you decided, were you in earlier in high school, junior high, or was it a no, trajectory? I was, uh, I was graduated and, uh, just, just by a few weeks or maybe a month. And, um, I had no intention to go in the military. I mean, Vietnam was still fresh in, in most of most of my, me and my buddies' minds. And uh, well, one friend wanted to go in the Coast Guard because he knew college wasn't really in the cards for him. So uh, I thought I better go protect him. So I went down there and uh, to the recruiter with him. And we both uh, watched a couple movies and said, hey, this looks pretty cool. Lots of beaches and Florida. <laughs> so I, can, I can handle that. And uh, neither one of us could get in the Coast Guard, though, and for different reasons. And... Uh, so I thought I'd show that Coast Guard recruiter, and I went, I'd go join the Navy. <laughs> I want to get on some bigger ships, bro. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you keep your little cutters. I want to, I'm going to get on a craft, man. Yeah. Whatever. Fine, I can't be in your canoe club. I'm joining the yacht club. <laughs> 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 now, the yeah. Coasties are, are, aren't so bad. I, I go to their base once in a while, and I've stayed at their MWR facilities. Like, I just get back from... Lake Tahoe, they have a cabin on the lake. Oops, I didn't mean to tell anybody because that place is always overbooked. Because uh, you ever stayed at any of those MWR hotels? Yeah, I stayed at some uh, out in Hawaii. There's some uh, cottages on the, they call it the leeward side over by um, south of K Bay. Um, they're like, they go by rank and it's like 50 bucks for a cottage right on the beach. Isn't that awesome? That's the, I've stayed at some like places that that are just majestic. You could never get to as a civilian, or you would ha you would have to pay such a premium. Like I, I know I'm going on a tangent, but this is just to pepper up this podcast to make it a little more interesting. I stayed the one up in Lake Tahoe, and I was wondering why it was a big deal. Well, right on the water in Lake Tahoe, you can't get anything less than five hundred or four hundred a night, and this was a hundred hundred and five bucks. It yeah. was beautiful. Look out the window. There's the lake. Walk right to it. It was amazing. So uh, this Hawaii, with, uh, the Halikoa down in uh, Waikiki, you could do the same thing. And then right um, Waikiki Beach, dirt cheap. Fort Derusi, right, right there by the beach, if I'm correct. I don't remember what they call it. I just remember the Halikoa Hotel in Waikiki. That's a pretty good stay. You recommend that one? I've never stayed there myself, but I've known a lot of people that can't that have, and it's, I mean, it's a quarter of the price anywhere else. I know. That's, that's the, that's the lick. If you've got your VA benefits or you're retired and you have that ID card, if anything, yep. use it to stay at some cool places, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, you're still working for the government. So do you have an ID card through them or from the service? I've, I'm sorry, retired. 
Okay. 23 years and retired. And so I've got that card. And I've got the other one, but that one really doesn't work as much. I've been getting into yeah. the commissary or on base or anything. It's like, um, I'm here, I'm hanging out in the parking lot. That's all my privileges. <laughs> well, um, what was I going to say? So what year did you join? Uh, 1985. 1985. So two years before me. And, uh, that was still more the edgier Navy, not the bearded Navy. I don't think, right? That you guys no, have beard. Missed it by, just missed it by about, uh, I think eight or nine months. Back when, uh, you know, I, I said earlier to the guy I was talking to, I was like, you know, you guys kind of look like pirates or the Bee Gees. I'm not sure, but those beards were kind of suspicious, you know? Oh, yeah. And then, and then one day they, they change regulations. Um, that beard won't properly seal in the OBA if you have to fight fire. So they made everybody shave. Yeah. And that was the reasoning, if I recall. So, yeah, so. <clears throat> where did you go to boot camp? Uh, Orlando. Okay. Yeah, we we talked about that last time, the Orange Blossom Trail and all those fun places they have for sailors right off post or right <laughs> off base. <laughs> that was an eye opener for a uh for a kid from, a young kid from Minnesota to roll down to places like that. Did that seem like a big tropical experience? You're like, Wow, I'm here in the tropics. This is beautiful after coming out of Minnesota, probably were you there in the wintertime or summer? Well, no, I was there September through November. Uh, technically, I was in Orlando from September to uh, January. Um, it's a little the colder, rainier, lots of lightning months. But uh, you know, it didn't really seem tropical to me until I actually uh, finished up uh, A school, SMA school, and um, got to go up to Jacksonville, where my first ship was, and um, then I could actually see trees and the beach. Yeah. That was uh that was an interesting because I went to A school there too, but like we talked about it last time, I was in those condos because I was there later than you, right? Yeah, they and, were um, just starting to build those when I was in A school. It was they just uh built the McDonald's and they were just starting to build the condos. I w- we were still in the Quonset huts. Oh, Quonset huts, really? Yeah, forty men, twenty on each side with a bathroom in the middle that had uh, they had three showers, three shitters, and three sinks or something. Wow, that's some Navy camping right there. Welcome yeah. to the field. <laughs> I mean, uh, SMS Signalman A School, <clears throat> I liked it because we'd have a smoke break every 15 minutes or a gee dunk break or whatever it was. Um, they're like, okay, that's enough. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe there wasn't that much subject matter. They had to break it up so much. <laughs> it was, uh, it was a good basics. I, you know, it was kind of enjoyable. There was nothing that was too over my head. It was not that hard of a thing to learn. It's not like we were in nuke school and you'd see those nuke guys on the base when I was there. Were they there when you were there? Yep. Yep. They were there. And they were some stressed out son of a guns because oh, yeah. they were, they were jamming four years of college in the six months or nine months and, they were like, yeah, they didn't look happy. We looked happy. We're running around with our signal flags, doing PT, going to the pool, doing whatever. Yeah. And that was, those were the good old days. So your, uh, your first ship in Jacksonville, was that the Stark or was that a different ship? Nope. That was a Stark. Okay. And that's when you, before you headed over to the Gulf, you started doing another, uh, what med cruises on that? No, our first cruise on, on there was, uh, it was a MEF cruise, Middle East Force cruise. Um, we did a bunch of time down in Gitmo and Vieques doing ref tray and gun shoots and what have you, but we did some missile shoots before we went over, but. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, see, my ship didn't really do much of that. We did ref tray, we did unrep training mainly, but the, the guy I talked to, he was on a heavy cruiser. And, um, he was saying that you guys would go out to like certain islands that would, you guys could blow up or just launch yep. all your munitions and practice your sightings and all that stuff. Make sure yeah, your weapons Vegas were prime. Vieques Island was right, it's right off the coast of, uh, Puerto Rico. They closed it down, I guess, 20 years ago or more, but, uh, now it's a resort island. Oh, wow. <laughs> they, had out, they had one out in Hawaii too. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Like, not, not Lanai. It had some other name, but there was an island off the, one of the smaller islands um, that's not really named. I mean, it's got a name, but it's um, it's not one of the main seven islands. We used to shoot the crap out of that as well. Wow. So that's uh, that's a bit of a headache, I guess, being on the signal bridge here and everything just blowing off all day. 
I remember oh, yeah, that on my ship. <laughs> it, it is pretty cool. Did you ever get a chance, like, where you're in the middle, like, um, you know, with a battle group, and you get your whole, like, air show slash, you know, gun show? Did you ever go through one of those? Yeah, I mean, sort of. I mean, I've always been on tin can, so um, we actually gave one of those shows to an aircraft carrier in the 90s, and when I was on the Stark and Mobile Bay, we were uh, we would do when we're doing training and do gun and missile shoots, and we'd all be lined up. I don't know, ten oh, uh, ships, and then we'd all be shooting off to one side. Yeah, <clears throat> I remember doing that. And I remember seeing like uh, some of the aircraft, you know, breaking the sound barrier, just like sh- crack. I mean, it was amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah, those were uh, those were those were really. It's like, hey man, this is like everybody has Fleet Week. We got it right in the middle of the sea. VIP. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Um, so what were some of the first ports that you get to hit? Um, I mean, I hit a lot of Caribbean ports in the, uh, in 86 and early 87, uh, maybe just mostly 86, I guess. Um, you know, like, uh, St. Croix and Puerto Rico, Jamaica, obviously the Gitmo twice. Um, goodness. Yeah. That's when Gitmo was a trade base, not a, not a prison. Yeah, now it's a prison. Back then, it was that that base. Was that the same place they filmed in um, that movie? I can't think of it. Jack uh, Jack Nicholson's the. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, a few good men. A few good men. That base. That's what it was like back then, right? All the Marines. Yep. Wow. Just rough and ready. Now it's a prison for bad guys. Yeah. Well, I mean, still the rest of the base is still there too. I think they just put. The prison on the golf course. Oh wow! <laughs> and on the ninth hole. Of course, it was it was a golf course basically put on uh, on coral. You had to take your uh, fairway with you wherever you went. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Roll out that green uh, green carpet. We need some, um, you know, get some astroturf. I need to hit the ball. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well. So the Caribbean islands, I mean, did any of those, were, was that like a really eye-opening experience for you being a young guy and being out yeah. of Minnesota? Yeah, sure. I mean, all the palm trees and the water was, you know, I'd seen clear water up in Minnesota, but I mean, when we went to uh, St. Croix, you could see the entire bottom of the boat, see all the way to the, all the, all the way to the um, bottom of the, the, of the water where we were, like 30, 40 feet straight down, clear as day. Oh, wow. So that's just some beautiful stuff. I saw that in Greece when I was a young guy. I was like, wow, this is just see-through. And, you know, there's nothing I do that's mucking up the water when I walk in it, right? Exactly. But um, So that was, uh, did you do a lot of, you get to use a lot of your signalman skills right off the bat? I mean, did you have a pretty heavy-duty crew like a chief that was on you or LPO? No, we had, uh, we, we had a, f- a five-man signal gang that rotated. Um, I mean, not rotated, but, uh, you know, over the course of that, the first year and a half I was there, we, uh, we went through, uh, got traded out SM2s and, um, got, well, when myself and another guy were new seamen on board. So uh, we had, um, SM1, Ronnie Lockett, uh, when we went on deployment, SM2, Gil Berrios, and then myself, and uh, SMSA, I was SMSA at the time, SMSA uh, Earl Patrick Riles, and SMSN Jeff Sibley. Yeah, you get to know a crew that small. So were you guys port and starboard watch with that many people? Um, when we started out, when Pat and I were pretty young, I mean, we were young as far as signalmen go, uh, yeah, we, we, were, we were port and starboard with, you know, underneath the other guys, and then both, we both picked it up pretty quick, and by the time we were done with rough tray, we were on the way over. I think we were in four section duty. Well, that worked out right better through the med. You know, unless it was like as we we're going through the Suez or going through the Straits of Gibraltar, obviously we'd double up. But yeah, you get those longer watches. Um, we were doing eight on eight off in the Gulf, and those were uh, that was okay. We had a, we had a good sized crew. We could have two man per per watch yeah. usually. I think on the way over, we did the standard, you know, four-hour dog in the 12 to 16. 
Mark did the 16 and 20. One of those watches we dogged. I think it was a 16 and 20 we dogged. And then, um, and then, yeah, then when, once we got in the Gulf, I think we went to 12 on 12 off because we only had five guys and, uh, SM1 didn't stand watch, so. Oh. Do you guys have a first class lounge on your ship? You know, I don't think we did. Um, I mean, the, each berthing had its own little lounge area, but they were, I mean, it was like a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12, the couple, uh, metal couches bolted in and a TV. Yeah. And we, those things became really comfortable after a while. <laughs> <laughs> think Some of the things up with the deck in the, in the Persian Gulf. Right. I mean, any, anything is we had a little bench on the signal bridge where one signal man could crash if he needed to. And the other guy would stand watch and then wake him up as needed. And you kind of did that in like combat naps, you know, where you just get up, you're ready to rock. Yeah. No, you know, not Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> we had two flag bags right next to each other, right behind the mast, and then just forward of the flag bags. In between them, there was a small, it was a metal box the size of a phone booth with a desk shoved in there, uh, a light, and a bench box. And that was about it. <laughs> you, you go up there, get in the British phone booth. <laughs> oh, we couldn't, you, you couldn't go in there because there was a desk in there and the cabin underneath it to store pubs. And, um, that's where we kept, but that's where we kept our log and all of our like, clipboards and, and all the wands and everything jammed in that little micro wow. space. Yeah, smaller ship. I didn't realize what a luxurious signal bridge I had till years later. Yeah, I mean, uh, huge signal bridge area, but the actual operating area was tiny. You know, what's funny, I'm, at the end of the month, I'm going to visit uh, a former SM3 on my ship who was on during v- Vietnam. And we hit it off on the podcast. He's like, come see me. I'm like, okay. It's kind of like going back in time, like that movie where the aircraft carrier goes back in time or forget what that was. And they're, you know, about to face off in Pearl Harbor with a nuclear powered carrier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the movie I'm talking about. The name, though. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like, yeah, I'm going to go back and see the older me. He's going to see the younger him. So why not? Right. Um, but it's funny because when he was on the ship, they hadn't built signal bridge that I had. What they had was a little tiny shack like you described. And later they built a structure above. They built everything, a ship's TV station. They built a huge signal bridge. And uh, I didn't know how good I had it. I'm like, oh, whatever. This is where I work. I had no point of reference. Had I been on a frigate or something like my former SM2, he was on a frigate, the Kurtz. And um, he's like, well, yeah, we, we basically sat on the bridge with everybody. You know, we were on the bridge with everybody. <laughs> Is, yep. is that what you guys did too? And then ran up to do your signalman stuff whenever it came about? Yeah, we, I mean, if it was crappy weather or, uh, or just at night, we'd go hang out in the bridge and, and then, uh, whenever the officer of the deck or somebody would spot something, we'd go, you know, check it out and verify what it was. Or if there were ships out there, we might try and, uh, do some, get some training in. It's a flash. Did you? Did you guys have uh, the big eyes like fully up? You know, we guys were on the big eyes all the time or no? They weren't manned. To, I mean, we didn't have the man part of man, just the big eyes. So I see. Yeah. I mean, matter of, you know, um, now that I think about it, we weren't port and starboard in the uh, Persian Gulf because I was on watch by myself and the other four guys were down in the birthing. We got hit. Oh, oh my goodness. Been, we must have been in like, Eight section or, or, I mean, eight hour or four hour watches. So. Wow. So yeah, I mean, going to the, the key story here and you and I talked about it before. Um, you were, you were sitting there. Somebody noticed, uh, somebody, one of the lookouts noticed a missile coming in basically. Yeah. Robbie Williams, he was up, uh, he was the Ford lookout. He stood, he, he was on top of the bridge and, uh, pair of sound part phones and he saw a light over on the, on the port side, out at about 45 degrees, and he called down and said, uh, you know, Bridge Ford Lookout, I have an inbound missile. Port side, you know, zero three, zero three, uh, three zero zero, and uh, coming dead at us. And the officer deck looked over, and we all looked over there, and it just looked like a light bobbing there. And the officer deck's like, nah, that's a flare. And then that flare got really close and really fast. And, um, 
it looked like it was coming through the bridge in the last second. We sort of dove, and we just felt a bump like a tug hit us. And we all ran over to the other side of the ship, and because uh, we had heard the noise, we saw something skipping away across the water. We're like, you know, popped through my mind. Who the fuck just thought of, excuse my language, who the hell just thought it's okay. of a, uh, uh, a sidewinder at us? Because it, it looked like such a small, tiny missile. And, um, you know, I n- obviously never seen a missile shot at me before. And um, yeah. it did blow up when it hit the ship. It just broke into parts or pieces as it, as it entered and into four different pieces. And um, they're meant to fly. It was an Exocet, French Exocet missile. And um, it's meant to fly about 50 miles. And it only flew like, I forget, 18 miles, whatever it was. So there was still uh, you know, close to 30 miles worth of fuel on board. And it just spread the fuel everywhere and started fires and um there's a rocket engine i'm guessing as it was going through the warhead stayed mm-hmm. on board and i think the rocket engine went out the other side or the motor um and then a piece went into the chief's mess and killed three senior chiefs one of them was our quartermaster senior chief and he was our he was our chief and then um yeah yeah and, we always did work together with them Yep, we were in the same division. And then, um, then the alarm went off, and uh, I mean, we uh, we all just sort of freaked. As soon as we realized what it was, we just jumped into action and hit the general quarters and passed the word. And um, then, the, as we saw another one coming in, he, Robbie saw another one coming in, and uh, the uh, helmsman spun the wheel hard over to uh, starboard, and so that like he was trying to turn. And, uh, I, I think it wasn't because he got orders. He was just, he was doing what anybody would do, trying to turn away from something coming at you. And, uh, yeah. uh, in, in my, in my opinion, I think it might've saved the ship because when you turn hard starboard like that, it's going to drop the port side in the water. That missile hit on the port side. And then, uh, shortly after that engineering straightened the ship, the rudder back out and, uh, you know, probably brought that port side up high enough. So we weren't taken on, zillions of gallons of water before we could get the whole ship locked down except for where the fire was and uh, you know set uh, that that really makes a difference when you talk about that i mean you're describing it i'm visualizing it depending where that missile hits uh depends on how much water pressure is coming through that that hole in the bulkhead and uh you know how hard it's going to be to do your watertight integrity and how hard it's going to be to contain that you know, I mean, like I said, it's been 25 years since I got out and I still remember the principles of the firefighting. I'm like, that is one hell of a thing to patch. So above the water, you're going to have a better chance of saving parts yeah. of the ship, well, was, I guess. There was no patch in this hole. I mean, it was, it was no way 10 plus feet no. wide and, and it ran from Whoa. below the, the, so it hit below the main deck. It hit right at the, uh, the, um, second deck. Uh, and, but the split went down below towards the third deck and then the hole went all the way up to the bridge. When it blew up, when the second one blew up, it blew in, but it also blew the main deck up and ripped half the, um, the bridge wing off and, and, uh, sent a bunch of shrapnel through the entire, uh, like through the bridge and the CIC and Ricer. Ricer, wow. they kept all the, computer and electronic equipment for the the weapons and et cetera in combat. But, uh, and then we just, you know, um, started fighting fires. Luckily some guys that were in that lounge in our birthing. So the missile hit literally the first one passed right through our birthing. And the second one blew up just outside of our birthing. And, um, did so much damage. I mean, it wrapped, you know, those big heavy two by two metal um, frames that those chairs and couches and stuff are made out of. It took those yeah. and wrapped them around the, the, uh, the starboard um, hull around the, the angle irons, like they were clay. Um, the only thing wow. standing in our birthing really was uh, the AC unit, which was, you know, the size of a house. Um, the frames of the, of the sinks and mirrors because they were right behind that AC unit. And then the, uh, 
the 4x4 steel post that was welded to the deck that held the table in the lounge. Uh, wow. And then a few, uh, and that was the only thing that, it, that survived as far as like wasn't completely destroyed. There were four racks, uh, you know, four bunks, uh, what do you call them? Coffin lockers that didn't, weren't completely destroyed. Um, mm-hmm. because the other ones, ever, the other ones fell on top of them and just protected them from the fire for a while. Um, I only know that because one of them was mine and I was able to like pull my camera and some smokes and some cash and, and uh, a few other things out of, out of the locker, what was left of it. Um, wow. That, that is, that is, I see why it's such a heavy story to you because I'm putting myself in your shoes trying to visualize what that would be like. And you can't, you don't know what it's like until you're there. There's no way to really know from the outside, but my goodness. Yeah. You know, because I like to think of, okay, here's a situation. How would I solve the problem? I don't have the answer. Yeah. I don't have the answer for that, you know? Um, that That's, and just to think that you were on watch, that's probably the thing that sticks with you most out of this, I'm guessing. The the crazy thing is, is uh, uh, I was supposed to be in my rack. And uh, my best friend, Jeff Pearson, was the most man to watch that night for the 2024. And uh, I went to my my uh, supervisor who was SM2 and said, Hey man, um, you know, can I swap watches with somebody? You know, I've, we've been on cruise for this like what three months now. And um, I haven't got a chance to stand a watch with Jeff. I'd just like to stand a watch, maybe get on that cycle. So we can stand a few watches together. And he's like, yeah, sure. I'll swap with you. And um, thank God he was one of the guys that was in that lounge that they went out. The, when the first one hit, they were able to get, since it was an enclosed lounge, Fire didn't go into the lounge. So they were able to go out the starboard side door of the lounge up forward towards the missile mag and come out a hatch on the forecastle. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, so about, I don't know, maybe a dozen or more guys got out of the berthing that way. Um, everybody else, almost nobody else made it out of our berthing. Uh, I mean, a couple of guys made it out of the berthing, but they didn't, they didn't survive the second hit. Uh, oh, wow. So they're caught in the passageway or something from the other hit the passageway or there was one guy who was already, he's already gravely injured. And, um, uh, he was, they found him and you could tell he had already set some of his zebras. and was trying to get one of the last, one of his last zebras set for his GQ station. Um, when the second one came in and, uh, oh, wow. but all three of the other, uh, Jeff Sibley, Pat Riles and uh, Ronnie Lockett never made it out of the birthing that night. So it hit ops birthing pretty much. If that was your birthing, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah, we call it ships control, but it was basically ops birthing. It had the uh, bosomates, signalmen, quartermasters, um, and uh, somebody else in there. But like the downstairs was the what we call combat systems, and that was like the OSs, the ETs, the FCs. Uh, oh wow! A lot of those, a lot of those guys didn't make it out that night um, because the. Uh, so their birthing was right below ours, and the hatch was on the port side. The main hatch to come out was on the port side. And um, so they came up out of that hatch, and some guy, uh, I think five guys from their birthing stumbled and fell out the side of the, right through the hole in the side of the ship. Um, wow. Four, four of them got picked up ten hours later, I think, by like a, uh, I don't remember, it was one of their, I don't remember which vessel picked them up. And then there was a fifth guy there's a gunner's mate who's floating for like 12 hours. I think he was picked up by a French tug or something. But all five of those guys were rescued. So they uh, they were man overboarded right out of the, right out of the gate. Yeah, but we had no they idea just, because mm. they went out the hole in the side right. of the ship. And we were already starting to try to fight fires up on the bridge. And uh, there were other guys that made it. No way to, I'm sorry, go ahead. No way to do a, an efficient muster under those circumstances. That's for sure. Not at all. Not at all. I mean. We really couldn't figure out um, who was who had, who had made it through and who hadn't until at least a couple of days later. Um, uh, they didn't identify one of the guys, uh, but one of the boss mates, for uh, several days. They only found a small piece of him. Oh my goodness! So these guys that were over the side, they all survived floating yeah. out at sea for twelve hours. The five that went over the side, they survived. I think there was a. They believe there was a sixth guy who might have went over that didn't make it. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, 
he, I mean, he either could have burned up or he could have fell over the side and nobody, he was never found. So. Wow. I mean that, I know I'm sidetracking, but that's, that is to be over side in the middle of the ocean. I mean, you guys were in which Gulf again, which Gulf were you in? We're in the Persian Gulf in the Southern Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf. Yeah. Southern Persian Gulf. Off the coast of gutter. Okay, I mean, there's sea snakes out there. Uh, and sharks. That's crazy. Yeah. Sharks and sea snakes. We saw the sea snakes you don't worry about because um, the, about the only place they can really bite you is in between your the webbing and your finger. Um, oh, really? Yeah, they've really... I didn't know that. Most, yeah. But the uh, for the most part, I mean, they might be able to get a small piece of your skin somewhere. I'm not sure. But um, but the sharks, they were very prevalent. Um, as we were fighting the fires, we went through... I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 or more OBA canisters. They actually had to fly out three pallets full from, uh, from Bahrain off the, uh, the desert duck brought them out to us. And, um, you know, we had a couple trash cans we were filling up at first. You know, you drop the canister and throw it in the trash can, grab another one, go for it. You did that a few times till you got worn out, and then you'd swap the OBA because we only had, I think when we started out, we, we had less than a dozen OBAs on the ship to fight fires with, so. Um, but after a while, the trash wow. cans were just full, and the, and the XO just said, chuck them over the side. This is uh, before the green movement, I guess. And uh, so we were dropping OBA canisters, and when you throw them over the side, they'd hit the water, and, man, sharks would just, boom, hit them like they were a lure. And uh, Wow. It, uh, it made everybody it made, made everybody fight fires a little harder, because uh, knowing that, uh, that that's what happens if you decide you wanted to swim instead of fight. <laughs> that that is that is like you're you're surrounded on all corners. I mean, that's like a very this whole this whole situation is very apocalyptic. Like, oh, fire missile! Oh shit, sharks! I can just I can see that, man. Yeah, and it was. Fuck, dark. I mean, I, I never get I never get to see any sharks because your ship was closer to the waterline, so I never saw them. I was higher up. Oh yeah, yeah. they never popped up. I think our fan tail was maybe a dozen feet off the water tops. But uh, oh my gosh, I'm. Yeah, and the other thing that, you know, that people don't realize is like, so nowadays they have these fancy fire helmets that look just like the civilians and they have lights on them and they have these big heavy canvas suits that they with insulation and, and the boots. Yeah. The nifty, nifty gear. All of us were fighting fires wearing uh, dungarees and t-shirts because that was the uniform of the day. I don't think anybody had a, a dungaree shirt on. Steel pot helmets. And uh, some of us were smart enough to grab our, uh, the little thin cotton gloves out of the uh, gas masks. And oh yeah, from your for your NBC. Yeah, NBC your gloves. NBC are like a tan yeah. cotton glove, and we'd grab those uh, just to have something to protect you because um, when we were going in to fight the fire in Ricer, it was about seventeen hundred degrees, and it took us a while to even get the door open. There was so much heat in there, and um, the fire the the. the the room, rooms above us were also on fire. So any water that was being sprayed as we we're walking in trying to get to the door, um, as it was dripping off the ceiling, it was almost at the boiling point. Oh my and, God. Yeah. So we got hot water. Dripping, boiling dripping boiling water. Yeah. On your backs and your necks, just dripping on you. Yeah. And we had to, and unfortunately, you know, the, the, uh, the time, uh, you know, that we, this is only a few hours into the, the fighting and, um, you know, firefighting. We didn't have time to move anybody, or so in that passageway there were uh, three or four of our buddies laying there. Um, first couple times we went in it was uh, it was pretty spooky, but then somebody found some jackets and laid them over their faces, so we didn't have to worry about that. But wow, that was uh, you just turn two. You just turn two. You fight for your life. Yeah, you realize that you know you want to stop and take this person and do everything you know. He's trying to do something for him, but you realize that they're also not going anywhere. And you got to put the fire out, otherwise you can't help yourself, let alone help them. No, it's it's always it's forward motion. I mean, I can't see any other way to take that situation. I mean, uh, I'm I'm sure that 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 uh, incident really probably brought brought back and changed a lot of firefighting standards in the Navy. Oh, definitely. all the intel and the data they took from that, right? Yeah, that's that's why we went from. You know, having uh, brass, um, we, they weren't called fairy nozzles. They were called something. I don't remember what they were called. We'd the have, long curved ones? They were no, like no, the extendo? No, I'm just talking about the nozzle on the end of the fire hose. It was like 
Oh, I had a, I yeah. The, it just had a single hole, and then the bottom, it looked like a uh, it was a cap that had a bunch of holes at different angles. So if you pulled the, the bale halfway back, it would go up the bottom, and it would spray a wide, a wide pattern. And if you pulled it all the way back, it would shoot a solid stream out of the top. And then you could take that bottom cap, and you could unscrew it and put in a uh, metal pole that had a bend on it with a pineapple up on the end of it. So that the pineapple, that's what I was trying to talk about. Yeah, yeah. so that guy would stand. So the first team would go in fighting with a wide angle, and the guy with the pineapple would put that over the top of the team in front of him to keep heat off of them while they were fighting the main fire. And uh, we mm-hmm. used those a lot trying to get into that, um, into uh, Ricer. Uh, because it was so, when we opened that door, there was just, you know, we were spraying in solid stream there just trying to get any water in there. But you could see it just when it would hit something, it would just vaporize. Wow. That's that's extremely hot. So you had to cool the exterior before going in, pretty much? Well, I'm guesstimating here. Well, we we tried to cool that bulkhead down, but in reality, it's not doing much when the fire inside is just yeah so hot. Luckily, um, there was a, a tugboat that pulled up, and it took two of its fire cannons, went over on the starboard side, and just, put, just sprayed water over the whole side of the ship, trying to cool it down enough that... Um, we could actually, it would help us get in there and cool the fires down, and help us be able to get into spaces with fire hoses. That process, when you when you get the door halfway cracked, or not halfway cracked, isn't the, the first uh, part of that procedure is to get the, the pineapple in there through the crack that you have there yep. through the door? Yeah, we did that, and, um, and we let that spray for, you know, I don't remember what the procedure at the time was, whatever, 30 seconds or whatever it was. And then... Um, uh, they had a one of those big metal firefighting. It was like a big metal pry bar thing. They put that on the top, and I actually get down to the floor and kicked with both of my feet. We blew the door open, and it threw us all, all against the far bulkhead, and the door just slammed right shut. And uh, oh wow, yeah. So <laughs> like a, like a backdraft, it sucked it back in, it, like it well, popped it, open and popped back. So the door opened inward to, into the space, and as we tried to kick it open, oh, okay. the, the pressure and the heat just slammed the door right back shut. And, uh, oh my gosh. So then we, the next time we, we wedged the, uh, that pry bar in and slowly opened it. And as we were spraying the fire hose in, we got it open far enough. We got enough water in there that we could finally push it back and keep it open, uh, wedge it open and then just walk in there. But you can only go in there for about maybe five minutes because it was just so hot and you could feel your, your feet starting to melt underneath and, and all the hot water dripping down on you. And, um, and by the time you got into that far, I mean, it had already been 20 minutes or 30 minutes fighting the fire. And uh, even though mm-hmm. they tell you to breathe calmly, <laughs> to, to ration your, <laughs> ration your opiate canister, when you're going into a fire where you can't see anything and all you can feel is um, beyond oven heat hitting you, uh, you tend to breathe a little faster. <laughs> That, that's the thing. I mean, those OBAs, they're sitting there on a timer, cling. You're like, uh oh. You know, you're yeah, under well, the door. Up, maybe it has. What we ended up doing was, you know, normally set it for 30 minutes. Could you get a solid 30 minutes and have another 10 or 15 minutes to get out of the space if you need? They were 45 minute timeline, right? Usually, I forget. I think so, yeah. Length the the was good for 45, supposedly. Um, we were sending them to 15 minutes, not only because you're breathing so hard, but also because, uh, you're, um, you, you you just couldn't physically stay in the space. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's that's the craziest thing. I mean, an OBA. You're sitting there fighting this fire with dinosaur equipment, and you're still kicking ass. I mean, yeah. comparatively to what they have now. I mean, I was a hot suitman too, so I got some other training, but I didn't get that. You know, we were at Treasure Island getting firefighting training over here in California. And we went up against, it was us, the OBA boys, and our dungarees tucked into our socks. Yep. And the balaclava and some gloves going into the building where they turn up the fire. And then here's the pretty boys from the firefighting department. They go, oh, yeah, if I'm running out of energy, I just purge. I just hit this thing, and I get all this oxygen, and I can keep going. Yep. I'm like, uh, we're fighting fire with friggin' farmer equipment. I don't know. Yeah. So I can imagine what that what that spectacle must have been. I mean, God, that is that is just you, you fought fires for how many days straight now? Well, we got hit at uh, 2112 on May 17th, the Sunday. And most of the fires were out by uh, Tuesday, so it was mid-afternoon. I think that's about when I got killed wow. off the ship. 
sometime Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, we had a couple of reflashes. Um, I know the last reflash I remember was Wednesday afternoon after we were back anchored out or uh, tied up next to the um, LaSalle out in the middle of the harbor in Manama. They wouldn't let us pier side because we still had that 500 pound warhead on board. Wow. Yeah. That, that, so that's, that's the deal right there. I mean, you guys were, so they took you off the ship and relieved you of duty after a few days, gave you on a tender or something, or, and then put you back on, or how did that go? You were saying, kicked oh, no, off the so ship. We, we tied up to the LaSalle and we went, and, uh, we were, um, actually when I, before we even got back to, um, all the way back to Bahrain, um, we weren't that far away, only like, I can't remember, 30, 40, 50 miles. Um, the Cunningham towed us back. And um, once they, shortly after they started towing us back, they told they they were going around and hunting for us and saying you need to get off the ship and go lay down because we've been up for you know, forty eight hours or whatever longer. Wow! And um, we hadn't really eaten anything. And, um, some some of the cooks were running around with uh, gallon jugs of water and I don't know if they had a like apple halves or something. Um, mm-hmm. But most of us were surviving off of water and cigarettes for two days. And uh, so they loaded us up on a Mike 8 boat and sent us over back over to LaSalle. And I just remember when we pulled up, the uh, you know, you're worn out and tired, and you're just covered in soot. And they pulled up in the well deck and dropped that, that gate, and I felt like, uh, all I could think of was that I felt like uh, MacArthur going back to the Philippines, walking off of a Mike 8 boat. Wow. Uh, but uh, we walked up into the hangar, the, um, you know, the, the interior, I guess, I don't know if it's a hangar or not, but interior well deck of the LaSalle and uh, yeah everybody was there greeting us and they had clean clothes that they pulled out of storage and given us cigarettes and, and had a cot you know, they, they, uh, wow. they weren't cots they were um, I don't remember what kind of stretchers they're called but they're like a canvas stretcher uh, with two poles and it, they lock out mm-hmm. so it keeps it off the ground just a little bit so they had everyone on uh, Every one of those and all their cots, and I think they just had some mats. They had everything laid out so you could, they could find a place for us to sleep. So, wow, we stayed I mean, there. That must. I, I, okay, go ahead. I just figured they would like have you on like the deck, and they're blasting you with the fire hose, washing you off. I don't know why I thought uh, that. No, they let us. They let us uh, before they before <laughs> they blast us. They uh, uh, most of us just walks like Rambo. Like we'd have a cigarette and we just went laid down on the bed on the cots and, and, uh, slept for as long as we could. And then, uh, then they let us, you know, they gave us some shampoo and toothbrushes and let us take a shower. And, uh, I think they had some dungarees and they had some weird coveralls. And then, uh, after a couple of days, they got the, um, they got the warhead off and all the, all of our shipmates did didn't make it. Um, they went and identified who they could and all the bodies off the ship. And then um, they pulled us in and put us pier side. And then the uh, the Acadia pulled in, the destroyer tender. And The tender, yeah. Yep. And we, uh, they gave us a berthing on there, basically. Uh, and, uh, and then we went to um, a sort of it, it was more than port and star, but I called it port and report. We'd stand. Yeah. Uh, so Monday you'd stand a full 24 hour duty. Tuesday you'd work until four o'clock or 1600. And then, um, you could go on Liberty until I think it was 2200. And then you came back, slept, got up, did another day of duty. Next day, did a full day of work and got your whatever it was six hours of Liberty. And uh, we did that wow. for about 30 days. And then they flew a little over a third of the crew back. Somewhere it was just their time, uh, you know, time to rotate. But um, they flew this these guys back and uh, so that they could be there when we pulled in. And then, uh, and then we sailed back. And we, uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, our combat was gone and, they, so they put a, like a, a Raytheon civilian radar up on the bridge and a little scope for us, but uh, like a yacht from a yacht here, take yeah, this. something like that, yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's good for fishing. Catch some fish. And yeah. then since there was only two Sigmund left, um, we had a guy volunteer from Norfolk. 
Uh, he volunteered to fly out, and uh, but he didn't stand and watch with us. He just sat on the bridge and did his ESWAS and tried to get OD qualified or counting officer qualified. Well, uh, SM2 and I stood port and starboard watch, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, all the way back. And uh, every 30 minutes, we were um, we would uh, do a, an exchange with the Stephen W. Groves, who was ahead of us. Uh, we would give her our posit and um, course and speed, and she would send back her posit and course and speed, so we can make sure that we were matching up. You know where we where we were at this certain point in time, and and that we were on the same course and speed, uh, because the only radio we really had was uh, uh, I don't even know if we had bridge to bridge. I think it was just a uh, walkie talk, like a Prick seventy seven or something like that. Mm-hmm. A, a big, an oversized walkie talkie. CB. I mean, I'm being sarcastic, but I mean, yeah. this is when it shows. This shows the value of a signalman. Yep. I mean, there's nothing else you could have done. The signalmen um, are the ultimate communicators in that in that way. Yep. I mean, computers are badass and radio and all that, but yeah, well, when electricity uh, shuts down, right? Yeah, I mean, right after we got hit, uh, maybe uh, not right after, but uh, several hours after, um, uh, somebody spotted, um, I was off fighting fires probably, and somebody spotted a ship coming in. and So I ran up to the bridge and grabbed, grabbed the light. A little handheld light, and uh, we had no. There's no electricity on the port half of the ship, and uh, a trigger gun. And the captain had the little yeah, trigger, right? Yep. Captain came up and, and uh, asked me to hail him, and first I gave him an SOS, and they and they, they rogered up and started saying, "Hey, we're on fire. We've been hit." And he said, "You know, how can we assist?" And and uh, but yeah, I got to converse back and forth with uh, them and. Was the uh, that was when the tugboat showed up? We directed him to the far side, and I think they came up close and swapped and gave him a walkie-talkie or something, and so they could communicate a little quicker as far as uh, where to where to shift the water to and everything. And then as more ships came in, we uh, we talked. SM2 was actually down on the uh, on the forecastle when that tug was coming in. He didn't realize I was up on the O2 level talking, um, and he was trying to contact him with a uh, uh, because a battle lantern, the little uh, the yellow ones, yep, with the, the metal yellow ones that we had in the birthing, right? Yep, the little trigger switch or the little uh, toggle switch, and he was trying to do that, aiming, at, aim it, trying to aim that thing, and then I think he finally saw that uh, he could. He, I think he finally, finally looked up and saw that I, there was another light up on top. So, yeah, that's uh, that's crazy when you realize in that moment. I mean, you were going. Oh my gosh! Your, I bet all your signal skills came to their top level right at that moment. Well, like the clarity, they, I they bet you were have, focused as hell. In all actuality, all, all I was thinking was, please, dear God, be friendly because we're really close to Iranian waters, and I don't want them to come start shooting at us. I, no, I can no see were, that. No one were a lame duck. Every time a plane flew over by, everybody would sort of cringe and look up, and uh, wondering if oh my god, someone coming back to finish finish the job or. Yeah, was, yeah, the after, the after, the aftershock of that, I can yeah. imagine. And then, then finally, we got. I guess the radio was up for a little while. Um, and they got a hold of the plane that was circling us. We had no idea what it was, and uh, the um, it ended up being the, the AWACS that, was, uh, that had been monitoring the, the airspace, anyways. Okay. So they stayed there until I think they finally sent some planes out to out of uh, Saudi Arabia or something to come just give us a cap until uh, make sure no, no one else was coming out and trying to do anything stupid. So how long before they knew what had happened, do you think? How long do you think the delay was? Well, so the... Um, obviously, we, Meaning like any bigger command or right, any so other part of the Navy? Radio apparently got a SOS out saying we had been hit with missiles and the AWACS have been tracking the plane that flew out of Iraq down the coast of Iran, came at us, shot us, and was heading back. Um, two F-15s from Saudi Arabia went out, but they are um, they have to call back and go up through their chain of command to, to shoot a missile back then. And so they 
they were following him but couldn't shoot him. And the uh, I think it was the Kuntz was pier side, and um, she had she put birds on the rail, and her captain had birds on the rail and was tracking the uh, the plane, hoping that it would veer just. In, he, I think he had a, a 95 mile range on his missiles and the plane was like 105 miles. So he just outside of range to be able to shoot. He was waiting to try and get a, hoping it would veer in for a little bit, but never did. I think the Coots also, oh. either the Coots or the Cunningham, um, left port and left like more than half their crew on Liberty. They, the captain said, run away right now. Just go. And they just steamed away. Oh, wow. Unfortunately for the uh, Stephen W. Groves, um, they got to go home early. And we were all like, oh, man, you lucky bastards. And uh, uh, But they were about halfway up the Red Sea when they heard we got hit, and uh, they just turned around. And then they got orders to come back anyways, but uh, their cabin turned around before they got orders. He figured, I better go back. Wow. This shit's going to hit the fan. And I think at the time we only had um, – but well, we had the, the four of us were there, the Coots, the Cunningham, the Groves, and the Stark. And then I think there were a couple of ships that had just gotten into the Gulf that were um, like maybe the Clackering or something. They were coming to relieve us. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're, you know, we did you do your four months in the Gulf and a you know, month over, month back, four months in the Gulf. The um, only thing I think you made, I just, I just thought of this because I go, what was my situation like it, comparatively? I had a stinger missile on top of the signal bridge. Mm-hmm. That would have been no problem. And I, I knew where it was. Yeah. We had, and I knew how to get to it. We had, <laughs> you know what I mean? we had two stinger missiles and a suite of stinger dead on board. And, um, and we had, uh, uh, both the 50 cals were, were, uh, were up on the mounts, but, um, it just so happened we had just left Bahrain. We were heading south. To do, um, to test out. Um, we had a part break basically, and one of the guys on board was able to fabricate the part out of not thin air, but out of materials we had on board. It was some sort of a seal, I think, for the control pitch propeller or something, the pump. And um, so he's able to fabricate that, and we were out testing it. So we're doing a full power run and um, doing some turns, and I think, you know, Maybe not a full crash back, but um, putting the putting the uh, propeller through its paces to make sure that the pump was working and everything. And um, so there was no no stinger guy on board because we weren't expecting anything bad to happen. And um, and the ROE was uh, really uh, the guy almost had to be parked on your flight deck before you could shoot at him. And uh, Oh yeah. So, and and right after we got hit, the XO was worried about the fire, and or was it the officer of the deck? I can't. Maybe it was the officer of the deck. And um, he had he had us throw the stingers and all the fifty cal ammo over the side. Shortly after we do that, we see a plane coming in. And we're like, why the fuck did we just throw those, t- those missiles away? But luckily, it was <laughs> it was the it was the AWACS, so we were so. We were fine, but. Oh my gosh. Imagine just out of impulsively, screw that airplane, take the AWACS out. That just would have been a clusterfuck. Yeah. Well, luckily, but, uh, we didn't realize he was at like 15,000 feet. There was no way we were going to hit him with a stinger or 50 cal. We, we had a stinger operator detached to us. Yep. He was an E3 box of rocks. Yeah. And we, I'm going, and he's had, hanging on the signal bridge like he's Mr. Pig. I think we had like, I think we had several stinger guys, stinger techs. Or, No, had this a, guy was fresh out of boot, a, and, he, and, he, and he didn't he didn't have any wherewithal. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm going to grab I mean, it from him. Basically, they, they took the, those Stinger deck guys. They basically took them straight out of boot camp and said, "Here's how Stinger works. Here's how you shoot it. If somebody tells you shoot it, you point and shoot." And I mean, it's not a hard yeah. thing to operate. Not at all. <laughs> That's why he was walking around like, "Yeah, I knew how to operate." I go. Whatever, big time. Yeah. <laughs> like you're half aware as it, you're half aware as it is right now. Shit goes down. I'm pushing you out of the way and grabbing it myself. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> Little did he know. I mean, I always said that in my back pocket. Yeah. But yeah, that was, uh, cause our ship didn't have all the stuff yours did and yours get shut down before you could use it because wow. you, it was, we were, it was like a 
there was no reason for any reason anyone to be shooting at you right during that time could've, there was no reason we could have got a missile up in time but we didn't even know yeah. what it was and there was there were some other circumstances somebody had left their post um, down in combat to go mm-hmm. use the head or grab a soda or something and um so there was some i know that somebody got in trouble for that um yeah well wow. uh, it, it was one of the ews who would have been able to differentiate between a plane and a missile unfortunately right uh, the signature yeah but uh yeah i mean that's a trip yeah the the, the c was just wouldn't have been able to shoot at all mechanical stops would have stopped it before it even got up that far forward the uh it couldn't rotate far enough like you were saying last time we talked it yeah. would be shoot shooting degrees away from target right yeah, yeah. and then the uh our 76 millimeter, the uh, Automalera, would have been able to uh, engage it, but I don't even know if it was loaded. Um, yeah. And, um, and like I said, then the missile. And again, if you don't know, I mean, it seemed like there were less than seven seconds that it would take to get a missile up and launch it between when we saw the flare right. and when it the first one hit. Once that first one hit, right. everything was sort of jacked up. It, it cut. Well, tri- it cut electricity. It cut fire mains. It cut all kinds of damage. It shut off all the stuff that you would use to counter the next one. It sounds like. I mean, it, it am I right about some that? Of it. I don't know if it shut off everything, but the set, when the second one came in, that shut off. That that killed the power to the whole front of the ship. It um, severed the uh, completely severed the um, the, uh, the vertical loop of the horizontal the loop that ran up the port side and the. The second deck, I can't remember which one it is now. It was 30 years ago. Wow. So my brain cells have been uh, disposed of properly by, yeah. by whiskey. So <laughs> you gotta you gotta expose them to that whiskey, the good stuff. <laughs> oh yeah. Now that you can afford it and you don't have that E1 pay, you're you're off the <laughs> uh, malt liquor bowl and the Pabst Blue Ribbon. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> no, I um that that's um. That's just like, uh, if the EW had been there, you guys wouldn't have had to see it through binoculars and the ABC, you can do the math. I mean, you've got it all, the game plan, the chess game. We may have saw it. You know, like it's, like I said, we weren't in it. Um, we didn't, we weren't in a threat posture. Didn't, I mean, it, I mean, even the, even the, the AWACS didn't believe that right. we had a threat coming because on a regular basis, the Iraqis would, leave Iraq, fly down the Iranian coast, drop bombs or shoot something that was either going into right. or coming out of Iranian ports because that was during, you know, we still had a full year and some change left um, before the end of the Iran-Iraq war. And then once they saw um, F-14s or F-4s coming out of Iran, they would turn towards us um, and ask for a flyby, which we would let, let them do because we were quasi-friends back then. And, um, the Iranians would see us and they would turn around and go back home. And so they flew that same pattern, but this time they didn't drop any bombs or shoot anything until they turned towards us. They didn't ask for a flyby. They just shot us. So before, you know, wow. like I said, it was, they were, I think, I want to say it was about 18 miles for the first one and like 11 miles for the second one or something. And wow. And, and I think we got, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, Pat our, our crew on the back, our whole crew for saving the ship, but you know, it, it might have been a different story if that first one would have blown up. It might have done more than it might have cut the ship in half far enough that we couldn't have saved it. The um, you that's the HMS, that's what I'm picking up listening. There's a, there's a lot of variables here. Yeah, the HMS Sheffield down in uh, the Falkland Islands took one of those same exact missiles, and um, she went down in a couple hours. Wow. So, do you, do you do you do you think this experience changed the protocol? You weren't on every ship thereafter, but do you think it changed the protocol of readiness of uh, all ships thereafter in the Persian Gulf area for, in those countries? For a time, yeah, of course. For, you know, high alert, then relax standards. It's an up and down thing, right? Yeah. You can't stay on I mean, DEFCON nine. I'm making up a number, but you know. Yeah, but I mean. <clears throat> For a long time, people did, but then, you know, like in 88, we went back into the Gulf with the battleship and a bunch of other ships and, and, uh, 
put, did a number on the Iranian Navy and their uh, oil platforms. And um, my little brother actually was on that battleship. And then... Uh, uh, oh, Jersey, right? That was the, uh, the, uh, the Mo, the Missouri. The Mighty Mo, the Mighty Mo. My sorry, I'm, I, I did a I did a podcast with the guy from the Jersey. Yeah, you're right. So and and, and I showed you I unrepped with him around that time yeah, too. I sent him that video and he was uh thought, he said he had just he was I think he had just gotten off that ship at that point. Uh, he he okay. wasn't there, but uh, it was very cool and he, that he uh, uh said he was going to show his son. The son's uh, the son likes the Navy a little bit so. That's pretty awesome, though. It's cool that we're all connecting. We're on different ships, and you get to sh- share your story that otherwise would just be, you know, it was covered in the moment, but everything fades in time. Stories get, phew, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I and, a lot of sailors and, in the Pentagon, and uh, I mean, not hundreds, but I see a lot of them, and uh, every once in a while, the, uh, the Stark will come up, and um, uh, or, you know, I wear, a, I have a lanyard that has in memory of the thirty-seven sailors we lost on a dog tag and people ask me what it is and I show them and they're like USS Stark what, what's that about and I'm like oh you're in the Navy right <laughs> right I mean it's like it's like uh, oh what app was that uh, yeah it's like a whole different yeah. generation right yeah well I mean you know um, for us you had a you had a few ships that had some bad damage to them but nothing I mean the last ship that had been attacked by another nation was the Liberty and then before that was the, like, it's technically the Pueblo. Um, I don't know if she was attacked or not. They got kidnapped. Yeah. Got kidnapped and brought into North Korea. But since they caught our little spy yacht. Yeah. yeah. But since the start, you have the coal. You know, that was another, another lesson learned. And, um, uh, and we've been fighting wars. That, so. that Gulf is a spooky place, man. Yeah. Well, technically, the, it, it always has been. The coal wasn't in the Gulf. She was, um, in Yemen. <clears throat> Which is, uh, yeah, the southern part. Of the- Which have been shooting missiles at, at, at a ship recently, right? And they shoot some missiles off of there, some rebels or something, Jehuti or whatever they're called. Uh, something. I thought they shot at one of our ships. Oh, yeah, I think they did like a year ago or something. Right. Yeah. We, they, we, um, we radar towers or something. I don't remember what we did. And we blasted the shit out of whatever they were shooting at us. Right. But yeah, if the, if the Navy's on alert and their situational awareness is up high, They'll blow the shit out of anything coming their way. Yep. It's just, it, it, it's variables though. I mean, the Navy is about variables, how your life turns out. You were on watch. So you ended up being one of the firefighters instead of a guy that was in the bad side of the birthing. And, you know, I, I, I understand that. I mean, I wasn't on, that didn't happen on my watch, but like when I was a kid, I was in Berlin at 86. And I was uh, not too far away from the disco that got blown up. You know, I was less than a block away. You know what I mean? Why the, there was a terrorist attack in, in Berlin. So yeah, you're, you're just, just one variable. You're here and you're not there and you're alive. That's, that's the most amazing thing I get, but also the firefighting and how you reacted under such stressful circumstances. You know, I, I always wondered when we were in the Navy, was this enough training? Am I really, really trained at this? You know, at certain points, as I get older, I became proficient and confident and all that. But first few years, I'm like, is this shit really going to work? <laughs> you know what I mean? Is this really going to work? Put our dungarees in our socks and run down the hallway and down the passageway and chase the fire? Well, you proved that it can. Yeah. And uh, I'm not surprised the Navy didn't have you guys go around and train everybody on shipboard firefighting for the next 20 years. You know, I'm surprised that didn't happen. Yeah. But you... Uh, so did you get any time off or any leave after that, after you get back from all that? Um, they gave everybody 10 days off when we got back in two, in two sections. And, um, yeah, I opted to, uh, I was a bit of a little scammer back then. And, um, I said I would stay for both. I'd stay in duty for both of those 20 days. If I could go home for my buddy's wedding in September. Um, and then they let me take two weeks and, um, I combined it with Harp Duty, Home Area Recruiting Program, and uh, so, oh, there you go. So I actually got to go home for a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that the hardest thing. We're, we were given like thirty days a year of leave or something like that, or two weeks. I forget how much it was. Yeah, we how many, we how many days. days? 
Only every career. Though. Never get to use them. Never get to use them, though, because we're always underway or something, right? Yeah, I was right? smart. Like I said, I was, uh, everybody wanted to go home for Christmas. <laughs> and I would, I would just take three or four weeks in November and go home and go deer hunting and, uh, have Thanksgiving with my family. But I'd be home for a month versus only getting 10, 12 days during the holidays. Oh my gosh. I had to, I had to sell 65 days worth of leave when I get out. Cause it was never, you were never able to take it all, man. And then it was based on seniority. Yeah. And it was based on how necessary you were to the, which watch they needed you for or whatever, right? Yeah. So you're like, shit, I got all this vacation. Yeah. We gave it to you. You just can't have it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what a, what a, what a flip around. So how many more ships were you on after the Stark? I did, uh, a total of four ships after the Stark. I was on the mobile bay. USS Mobay, CG-53. And then I went to, uh, sh- we shifted home ports to Hawaii and then I went, I mean to, uh, Japan. Then I went to, uh, to Hawaii for three years. Then I went to David R. Ray, uh, Spruance class out of, uh, Long Beach. And again, we shifted home ports to Everett. And then I was on, uh, Leyte Gulf, CG-55. Right, uh, from. Wow. In, uh, 07, 08. I retired off of her. So you, you stayed signalman until they changed the rating, right? At 03? Um, a little before that. I, uh, I tried, saw I, tried I tried to cross the- over in, um, uh, 96 over to IS. Um, we had, we, it was my third ship. We had an IS on board. I thought what he did was very cool. It was not too dis- dissimilar from doing Snoopy team stuff. It involved a little paperwork right. and, um, less watches. And, um, so, uh, but I couldn't. <laughs> a little more specialized, a little bit more VIP. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But uh, it didn't turn out the right way, and uh, I wasn't able to cross rate, so I ended up getting out in the Navy and going in the reserves. And then uh, when I got went to the reserves, they didn't have a billet for an SM1, so uh, uh, I crossed over to IS. Crossed over there. Yeah. And then came back in a couple years later and um, finished up my last eight and a half years. Tired. What a cool end around. See, in the reserves, it's all flexible, right? Yeah, yeah. You're a cook. I want to. I want to. I want to drive a tank. Okay, go ahead. You're in the army. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yep. And then <laughs> you get out of that mess deck finally. And I got really lucky that uh, <laughs> go ahead. The, the, uh, I was still young enough, and they needed they needed enough ISs uh, that I, they let me come back in a, on active duty without losing a pay grade. So. So an IS on a ship, were you just just uh, put on certain ships, or did you fly around in airplanes too? Or, I mean, well, so, what was that? What you can so speak I, on without giving anything away? I did, OPSEC. I did, I did three shore tours: one in Saudi Arabia, one in um, the Netherlands, and one in England. And then, um, and then I went to Leyte Gulf as an IS. And we basically, um, not only do you brief the, the captain on whatever he needs for intelligence, wh- wherever you're going, or what might be coming up, uh, other threats, et cetera. But then um, your ops boss usually thinks you don't have anything to do, so he gives you, you know, all the collateral duties and whatever else. Uh, I, I, right work. Yeah, like I, well, like I ended up being the uh, the OS division chief for about a year, I guess, uh, because they the OS senior chief retired and and um, the bill was gap for. Quite a, quite a while until the new OSC came on board. So I learned how to be an OS, sort of. It wasn't very good. <laughs> At least boss him around. Hey, hey, shine that belt buckle, son of a gun. No, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm giving you shit. But doing the IS stuff, it was just limited. Is, is that's like, like analytics, like you're doing threat analytics and anticipations and yeah, I mean, there's all kinds probabilities of probabilities and stuff. All kinds of stuff we do. I mean, you know. You help do you help the pilots do their planning when they're run, making runs runs into some place, both to give them all the threats, um, what to watch out where the things are, the best route to go to do stuff is. Um, we look at imagery. We uh, you, you do all kinds of stuff. So it's actually pretty interesting. Oh yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that's like better than like, hey, I look at the stack. I could tell from uh, 18 miles on the horizon it's a cruiser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love doing that. I, there I is still the, do that, though. 
right? Yeah. You're still the human radar. That You, you can't deny that the you signal skills were boat, badass in their own right. And I see a ship, and uh, first thing I start doing is I start rigging it. Uh. <laughs> That's pretty. That's see the the signalman thing, the human radar. Yeah, I believe that plays into a lot of things. They needed you for comms. They needed you for firefighting. They needed you for everything. Yep. And the signalman did it all. Yep. And I'm I'm proud to be part of that rate and to see somebody use it. But what a what what an experience! I don't think there's any. You know, this is a historical story, and this time it's recorded beautifully. Thank you for coming back. Okay, no problem. Anytime. Sorry to be. A lame, a lame signalman to ask you to resend everything that you just sent on your flashing light. <laughs> I figure you're still up. <laughs> you know, right? Well, I mean, I went from John Wayne to the Stark. It's been interesting. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, John Wayne. They're, they're, that was like that was a great talking to a 73 year old signalman, bud. Imagine that. I've met some. I've met signalmen in the most crazy places. Um, you know, I, there was a guy selling beer at a festival in. in uh, North Carolina, I can't remember, Wilmington, I think it was. And uh, I'm walking down the pier, and he saw my flags on my shoulder from about 150 yards away, 150 feet away. And uh, and uh, he gives me the Juliet, and I'm like, Ooh. Roger. <laughs> and, and he starts sending <laughs> some to me, and, I'm, and I start sending some back. And we're talking as I'm walking. And I finally give them, like, I- I'm guessing you were a signalman. He goes, yeah, I was in the Navy for four years during Vietnam. And then I did that on Merchant Marines for 20-some <laughs> years. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm just a disco dancer. What were you telling me over there? <laughs> yeah, it was some old Travolta moves that I learned, right? Yeah. No, I was, uh, I was doing semaphore the other day, just walking down the street, seeing what I remembered. Yep. It's kind of funny. I'm about 85%. Some stuff slips, some stuff comes back. But, uh, it was, uh, it's, it's something that I think the Navy still should have kept. Yeah. What's it going to cost you really? The, the prevention, the insurance policy, it's like a, it's a high payout life insurance policy is what it is at a low dollar rate. Instead of killing the segment rate and, and, um, you know, trying to give their job to quartermasters, I think what the quartermaster, if they would have merged the two rates and, you know, like, Moved part of the, moved the SMA school over to quartermaster A school. So you're still teaching flashing lights, semaphore and flags to the quartermasters. And, you know, I don't care if you call them quartermaster segment as long as the job's getting done and they know how to be, they know how to do recognition identification. And then they're already up on the bridge anyways. You know, you need to do a quick look out. Yeah. You need to find something. Um, and then you got have two on watch, one on comms, one on the, one on the nav, yeah. and you're, you're groovy right there. That's the way to do it. And, but you know, the, the professional master lookout, this was my thing. Like you work over there by the guys I wanted to talk to by sec nav and all that. Yep. <laughs> I put a blast on Facebook. I'm like, tell him to call me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was pissed when I saw those ships get hit. Yep. And even the 73 year old signalman said the same damn thing. It's like we would have seen it. I go, yeah, I, I, I would have seen a, uh, skyscraper sized friggin' oil carrier um, from at least 18 miles away going 12 knots like hey watch out we're going to get hit in 2 hours yeah you know yeah. I mean, i'm i was i was ahead of ahead of ahead i was always hitting the, the contacts yeah. but that's the thing that's the thing where i see that and we're like and then i read an article and they go well we have to rely on our old gray beards to pull from the old nautical ways to get everything ship shape and you know, I'm not trying to smack the youngsters that serve in the Navy. They're protecting our country. There's no way I want to talk down to them, nope. but I want to share, you know, yep. I don't want to talk shit to them and make them feel bad. Nope. You know, well, and, and, and I mean, and when we go ahead and say the Navy, Sorry. you know, the Navy's almost as, as much a fault for what happened, you know, beyond the fact that they've got, I mean, not only did they get rid of segment, but then, um, and give it to the quartermasters, but like on these new, uh, LCSs, the uh, littoral combat yep. ships. Um, I want to, I don't know if you saw my post on Facebook. I went and, um, visited the, uh, I think it's the Gabriel Giffords or something when she was pre-com still down in, uh, Mayport. And uh, every year we go down to Mayport in, uh, on May 17th for a memorial service for the 37 guys that didn't make it. And, um, we, uh, we happened to take a tour of that boat and there was one quartermaster on board. He was a QMC and I asked him, and they had a little signal bridge, sort of. It was basically a window that opened so you could hoist some flags up. 
that were in a little, they didn't have a flag bag per se. They just had a, a bunning pigeonholes, with flags in them. <laughs> and, um, well, at least it was something. And, uh, he said, yeah, they, he goes, they don't teach flashing light time for flags to the kids in a school. He goes, they're, they realize that it's a necessary thing and they're going to try and add it to the advanced um, quartermaster class. And I'm like, you need to teach it to the, the, the A school kids so that they have an idea. You need to start them young. Yeah. Start them. Yeah. Not just start them young. Class you know? of chiefs who probably don't stand most of the watches. And he, well, you know, what was, what was the, the, the guy I talked to with John Wayne. I said, how did you make, you know, how did you stay proficient as you were when the reserves for 16 years? He goes, my wife learned to do flashing light and she and I would practice at home yeah. <laughs> and do semaphore with them. Yep. I'm like, what an awesome wife, dude. <laughs> so he, he went right up the ranks, but that's, you've got to stay proficient. That stuff slips, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, I still remember, I you know, know Morse code and semaphore, but you know, could I send it? Sure. I've done, I mean, I, I kept doing it through my whole career, even after I crossed over to IS. Um, when I went to my last ship, I got on board there and was talking to the quartermaster and said, Hey, if you, are, if you guys ever need any stuff, help with your, uh, or insert whatever, signum and stuff, let me know. And, uh, I said, I was, you know, I was an SM1 at one point. And, uh, so they had to do some drill. They, had, they were actually doing drills back, this is back in 07, 08. Um, they would do flashing light and semaphore drills ship to ship. Uh, not anything nearly as intense as we would do was, can you send a message no. back? No. Send one message over, another message back. Pretty much. Okay. The cat is in the hat. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and um, so I got up and I sent the message. <laughs> Roger that. I sent the message and then he sent the message back and I just sat there and, and uh, tangled him out the whole way. And, and, uh, and then we, we all met and yeah, they had no idea what I sent over. <laughs> He just rogered up. <laughs> and I wasn't, I mean, I, I hadn't sent a signal. I, I used this for like years. And I was, I was purposely going nice and slow because I figured, you know, I'd sat on radio, I'd, I'd sat on, in radio once and list, tried to listen to Morse code. And man, that's, was like so alien. I mean, and that was when I was a second class. <laughs> and it was going, dee, 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 and you're like, uh, can you slow way down? Like, think third grade. <laughs> so, anyhow, I don't know. That's that's that, that's crazy to see what happened to the rate, and you get to see all that change. Yeah. So just you know, slip some kind of uh, extra form where you work and say, "Yeah, bring back the signalman." And uh, yeah, okay. Now, there, you know, us doing the podcast, somebody somewhere is going to hear this. And they're going to go, "Oh." Maybe we should do that. You know, it's not like, you know, we're talking about an old football team we used to belong to. Yeah, the Wildcats can beat anybody. They're the Wildcats right now. Yeah. <laughs> the Wildcats are 22 years ago, and you look back at them, they all weighed 145 pounds. You're like, no, Wildcats wouldn't do shit. But in this case, <laughs> sig- signalmen were a necessary thing. But I don't know. What would signalmen be doing today? Staring at their damn iPhone, playing Angry Birds? You know? Yeah. And that's technology is dumbing down the human in that element. I mean, we're going to have uh, self-driving ships. Littoral, isn't that littoral self-driving just about? Well, they're not self-driving, but they a ton of- one guy drives it like uh, sort of like Captain Kirk in the Enterprise. He sits in this chair above the other two guys and we're looking at radars and other stuff. And he just has a couple joysticks. <laughs> Pretty crazy. So they hire a video game player. They want you to play this video game to see if you're proficient, right? <laughs> Well, there's that, there's that sub hunter that's, uh, autonomous. That's right. You know about that one? They've been publishing that one. I think I've saw something about that. It kind of has like a, a thing that comes off the side, kind of like one of those outrigger canoes, like an extra beam to balance it. And then it just patrols for subs. And then it's, I don't know, it can do stuff to mess with them and stuff. Nice. Yeah, so that's one of the first, and it's like uh, it's like that movie with um, Jamie Fox where they have to hunt down the autonomous jet that's attacking everybody. <laughs> it was called Stealth or something. Oh. It's got a robot. It won't listen to you. Okay, that sounds silly. Now that's real. Okay, so gone are the days. Navy SEALs, very cool. 
Rangers, very cool. Guess what? Soon to be replaced by robot dudes. Not too far away. Sounds like science fiction. Sounds like I'm some old conspiracy theorist. No, I live in Silicon Valley. Shit's happening, man. <laughs> so, so we're going the way of the cowboy. Yeah, he used to have a gun and he rode a horse really good, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know? That's, that's the change we're seeing in this Navy. But, um, so I'm glad your brother got to see that video, man. And, and I appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah. Definitely like to have you back on here. And, you know, one day I'm going to meet up with all you guys that I do podcasts with. Like I said, I'm going to visit the, uh, I'm going in the time machine to visit my old, um, SM3 before me. Right. That's maybe, maybe that'll be the podcast and hang out in Kansas and meet a couple other shipmates. But, uh, this thing is an excellent recording. I might just drop it off uh, on Friday or, or Monday. This is going to be great. So I, I appreciate you coming back, man. Hey, no problem. And, uh, come back anytime. Just let me know when. For sure, Chris. You know, any feedback or any friends or anything that you think of that would be good, just hit me up. And um, this story is going to be around forever. And all you listeners, hit us up on AEC Stories on Facebook or AEC Stories on Podbean.com, or iTunes, AEC Stories, or Stitcher, or um, Spotify. Yeah, we're everywhere. And uh, give us your reviews. Tune in. Let us know how you like it. And thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah, we're everywhere. And uh, give us your